Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to discuss K-medoid clustering. A medoid represents the smallest average dissimilarity with respect to all the points that we have within a cluster. So when we say smallest dissimilarity, it means most similar objects. It tries to find out the most similar objects to be able to form a cluster. As the name goes, K-medoid sounds pretty similar to K-means clustering. But what is the main difference? Why do we do medoids? Because K-means clustering relies on the means or the centroid. And you know that a mean or centroid is always affected by the presence of outliers. On the other hand, the medoids are more robust to the presence of outliers. How do we start K-medoid clustering? So imagine this is a two-dimensional Cartesian plane where we have all these points. So we have taken a total of 10 points right now. And let's say we want to form two clusters. So we begin K-medoid clustering by selecting these two points randomly. Let's say in our case, we chose these two points as 2, 4 and 5, 7. Now what we have to do is that we have to calculate the distance of every other point, all these green points that you see here. We have to calculate the distance of each of these points with respect to both the medoids, one by one. So we want to calculate the distance of all the points with respect to this 2, 4 and all the points except the other medoid, all the points with respect to this 5, 7. And this distance would be preferred to be the Manhattan distance which is nothing but the absolute differences added up across both the axes. So x2 minus x1 or x1 minus x2, absolute value, y2 minus y1 or y1 minus y2, because you're just considering the absolute value, not the sign. This will be better understood with the help of data so that you can get more clarity. So let me show you the data. So this is where we begin. We've selected two points at random, and this is the collection of all the points that we had. These are the x coordinates and these are the y coordinates. We've made these two choices. 5, 7, and 2, 4. This is step 1. The next step would be to calculate the distance of each point with respect to 5, 7. Let us see how do we do that. So we've conveniently noted down x coordinates of all the points and the x coordinate of this medoid. Then the y coordinates of all the points and the y coordinate of this medoid. This is just to be able to calculate the differences easily. We could have done it on a paper as well, but I chose to do a spreadsheet because this looks neater. So what we have to do is we have to take a difference between these two values the absolute difference between 2 and 5 would be 3. The absolute difference between 5 and 7 would be 2. So 3 plus 2 is 5, Manhattan distance. We have done it for all the points, and we are representing it as D1. D1 represents the distance of all the points with respect to medoid 1, which is x1, y1. We need to do the exact same steps for medoid 2. So here we go. Listed down x coordinates of all the points. Listed down the x coordinate of the medoid, y coordinates of all the points, and the y coordinate of the medoid. Once again, the difference between 2 and 2 is 0. The difference between 5 and 4 is 1. So the absolute difference, 0 plus 1, is going to be 1. Likewise, we do all the calculation. So we got distances from the medoid 1 and distances here from the medoid 2. Now we have to compare these two distances. Now in order to assign each point to a cluster, we need to find out the minimum distance. For this, we will do a comparison. So this table represents all the points as the original points that we had, distances from medoid 1 and distances from medoid 2. Wherever the distance is minimum is what we would prefer for assignment, which means this point 2, 5 is at a distance 5 from the point 5, 7, but at a distance 1 from point 2, 4. So which is minimum? Of course, this is minimum. If this is the minimum distance, that's what we note down and we do an assignment to the medoid 2. Similarly, for the second point, this point 3, 4, again, is closer to the medoid 2. If you look at the third point, 6, 10, now this point is closer to the medoid 5, 7. The distance here is only 4, where the distance from medoid 2 is 10. So this will be assigned the membership of the cluster to which medoid 1 belongs. If we were to look at it visually, this is what it means. So we've kind of done a color coding for all the points closer to each of the medoids. In fact, the medoid would also be a part of the same cluster, so you can look at it like this. By now, we have formed two clusters. But we don't know if these clusters are good or bad. In order to do that, we need to calculate a cost. And how do we do that? So here we have color-coded the points with respect to their medoid. So this beige goes to the medoid 2 and this blue goes to the medoid 1. This is how we've just done the same color coding. Now, in order to calculate the cost, it's the same thing that we calculated earlier, just the sum of minimum distances. This is the cost that we have now. Why are we doing this? Because we made the initial choice of medoids randomly. We don't know if this is the best form of clustering that we could have done, or there could have been an alternative way. Now we need to repeat certain steps 
by changing our medoid choices. What do I mean by that? So in the original data, this point, 5, 7, and 2, 4 were selected as the medoid. But now we are saying is let's treat 2, 4 as another point and keeping the first medoid fixed, change the second medoid. So let 5, 7 remain as is. But we are now selecting another data point, which is 6, 9 as our second medoid. And now we have to repeat the same steps, which means we have to calculate the distance of each point with respect to the medoid 1 and then with respect to the newly selected medoid 2. At this stage, you might be wondering, why are we calculating the distance from the medoid 1 all over again? Please note there has been a change. Last time when we calculated the distance of all the points from medoid 1, we didn't have this point 2, 4 there because this point was acting as a medoid itself. So this never participated in those calculations. Instead, we had the point that we selected as the medoid now, which is 6, 9 as one of the points that we calculated that participated in the distance calculation. So because of this change, we have to calculate the distance from the first medoid once more. All the X coordinates, X coordinate of the medoid, all the Y coordinates of the points and the Y coordinate of the medoid. Once again, the Manhattan distance, same X minus X1 plus Y minus Y1, the absolute values, we get that. Similarly, the distances from the newly selected second medoid, which is 6, 9, we calculate the difference between all the X coordinates, the X coordinate of the medoid, the Y coordinates of the points and the Y coordinate of the medoid. We get that. Once again, this difference D2 and D1 will be competing for the minimum value. And the point will be assigned that particular cluster which belongs to the medoid at the smallest distance. So how do we do this? So once again, we've done the color coding. As per the differences, if you see 0.25 is at a distance of 5 from the first medoid, which is X1, Y1, and at a distance of 8 from the second medoid. So which is closer? D1. So D1 wins here and we note down the minimum distance. Next, we look at the third point, which is 610. It is at a distance of four to the first medoid, but closer to the second medoid, and that's at a distance of one. So in this case, the second medoid wins. So let's quickly recap these steps. We chose another medoid now, 69 instead of 24, which was the earlier medoid. One of the original medoids we've kept fixed. Next, we go about calculating the Manhattan distance of all the points with respect to both the medoids in paired terms. This time, once again, you see these points are all closer to the medoid 1 or 5, 7, and these points are all closer to the medoid 2 or 6, 9. Including the medoids, this is how the color coding should be. And now these are the clusters formed. So if you see, this arrangement looks different from the earlier clusters, which were like these. But do we stop here? No. This process iteratively continues. We will keep on changing the second point till we reach the minimum cost. With this arrangement, what is the cost that we are getting? So as you can see, the newly computed cost is 33, whereas the cost that we computed earlier was 27. So 69 is not a better choice as a medoid compared to 24, which was the earlier second medoid. If it would have been a better choice, we would have got a smaller loss. Now this process would continue to happen iteratively till we settle for the minimum score. What happens next is that keeping the first medoid fixed we try all other points as medoids till we find the minimum cost. That's one part of it. But how do we know that first medoid itself is the right choice or not? So, keeping the medoid paired with the first medoid, which generates the least cost in these steps, we will now try replacing the first medoid with all other points till we find the minimum cost. So, the steps will remain the same. Because we made random choices to begin with, we don't know if that yields the optimal result. That's why once we start with these two medoids, keeping one fixed, we go out looking for the minimum cost. When we find that pair, we keep the second medoid fixed and keep looking for the best choice for the first medoid. Eventually, this algorithm converges. Now, you can imagine this definitely overcomes that opportunity of k-means clustering because it is not calculating the averages, means, or centroids. But this could be computationally expensive because you're repeatedly comparing the distances between the points. That's pretty much about the theory of k-medoids clustering. And now we're going to see how do we apply k-medoids clustering to the same data set. We've been working on a specific data set known as the college survey data. This data set is about different colleges, 100 odd colleges, where we have the ratings provided by the students studying in these colleges on different aspects from teaching to extracurricular activity. In addition, we have two variables, airport proximity and median salary, which are on a different scale. We've done an entire video on data preparation prior to this, 
You may refer to that video for more details. But just to do a quick recap, I'll walk you through the critical steps of the data preparation. So we are at Google Collaboratory. I've already pointed to the data source called College Survey. We can click on this option and get to the location where this data set is and bring it here. So I'll just walk you through the critical steps. One of the steps that we performed was to first check if the ratings are as they're supposed to be. Typically, they're supposed to be on a scale of one to five, but it could be possible that data has a few entry errors, and we inspected that the ratings are on a reliable scale. Then we looked at the range of these variables, and we found that one of the columns had outliers. Now, in the theory video of K-Medoids, I mentioned that K-Medoids is relatively less sensitive to outliers compared to K-means because k-means works on calculating the distance of the points from the means or the centroids. And means and centroids, as you know, are sensitive to the presence of outliers. Okay. While k-medoids is not working on the means or centroids, let's see how it may still be somewhat affected. So it's relatively less affected, does not mean it is not affected at all by the presence of outliers. Let's look at the scenario where it can actually be affected by the presence of outliers. What if this is the arrangement of the points that we have, and we have an outlier point here? Now, as you can see, this point is very different from the rest of the point. So if we consider our medoids here, here, somewhere in this range, there's no problem. We can continue to work and keep on assigning the closest distances. But don't you think this point would also be seeking attention? If you form two clusters, this point would belong to one of the clusters? Or what if you end up choosing this point as a medoid to begin with? Now you'll be calculating distances of all the points with respect to this point, which again would be wrong because this point does not belong to the kind of data that you have. So once again, the treatment of outliers is important for k midwives as well. Even though it is not calculating the average, which is where it overcomes the weakness of k-means, it still gets affected by the presence of outliers. So we followed by treating the outliers in our case and all the other variables were free from outliers. Everything looks neat and clean. We went ahead and checked the correlations between the variables. We found none to be significant. And then we performed a scaling. In the detailed video, I also taught you how to bring the variables like airport proximity and median salary to the scale of one to five. There's a small tweak in this min-max scaler, which allows us to do that. Feature range, using this, we can do that. Once again, after scaling the data, we were ready with the treated copy of the data. From here onwards, we resume our k medoids clustering. So just try to do a quick recap. Like I said, if you need more details, refer to the complete video on data preparation. But this video would focus only on the k medoids. Now for k medoids, you actually would need a library called scikit-learn extra. And this may not come by default on Jupyter as well. So you'll have to do a pip install of scikit-learn extra. Then the syntax is pretty similar to the way we saw earlier. We're just calling the k-medoids class from scikit-learn extra dot cluster, and we are fitting the medoids. Just like k-means, k-medoids would also require the number of clusters to be mentioned to begin with. So we are choosing three, and we are mentioning a random state. Notice we've done a separate video on the choice of clusters, which you can always watch. Random state to ensure that we get the same values whenever we execute our code. We just do a fit of the treated data, which is the scale data. Because k medoids works on Manhattan distance, it will be wise to have the data on the same scale. Otherwise, it may end up giving relatively higher importance to the features, which are on a higher scale, which should not be the way we work on the data. So we fit it and we generate the labels. So let me just execute this code. And once that is done, these labels can be added to our original data for interpretation purposes. So we're creating a new column called k medoid labels and we are storing these labels that we generated here. It will be nice to check how balanced the clusters are. So we are doing a value count on the k medoids labels, and it shows that there are three cluster labels that have been generated. Cluster label one has 41 observations, cluster label zero has 31 observations, and cluster label two has 28 observations. Clustering is meaningful only with some interpretation. So what we are doing now is we are grouping by the cluster label, and we are looking at the median values of all the variables. Notice that college ID, which is a nominal variable, would not make sense as a median, so we are just temporarily dropping it from here. If we look at the data, this is how we get it. Pretty much similar interpretation as we did for k-means. We have discussed that in a separate video already. Cluster label one seems to be mostly lagging on all the aspects. However, it still seems to have a relatively decent median salary. Cluster label zero and cluster label two could be competing for the rest of the features. 
For example, cluster label zero, if you see, seems to be doing better on infrastructure, research opportunities, industry interaction, placement, location, diversity, financial aid, extracurricular activities, with all these aspects being rated high, they still do not have the best median salary. This is just a median representation. So in this case, when you're getting a better median salary for cluster label one, it could also be because very few people got placed, but they got placed at a higher package. Whereas colleges belonging to cluster label zero might have got just about an average or median kind of placement. On the other hand, cluster label two, which does not really do that well compared to cluster label zero, on most of the ratings, they have the best teaching and you can see their median salary is actually the best. So each cluster has its own characteristics. That's pretty much about the interpretation. Hope you got to learn how to apply KMAD Whites clustering. Thank you.